I want to share with you a scene from the comics. It's a really dark Miguel scene. A patron of mine showed me this and I just can't stop thinking about it. So in the comics, Miguel has this really terrible relationship with his mother. And just judging by the scene, she is a real piece of work. We find her in the situation where she's manipulated her sons into thinking that she's dying. And it's just to go them into expressing how much they care for her, it seems like. And Miguel is not having it and she is going in on him. She's calling him selfish, saying all he does is tear things down. He doesn't care about anything or anyone. Finally, Miguel tries to apologize and she slaps him. Liar, she shouts. So he tries to be honest with her and he gets another slap for being fresh. What do you want from me, he says. Nothing, she answers. You're completely self-centered. I keep waiting for you to change, but it's not going to happen. Why can't you be a real caring man like, like who, Ma? Like Gabriel? You're going to start telling me again how loving he is and no, because every time I do, you start making fun of him. But here's someone you wouldn't dare make fun of. She throws open the doors to her closet and it's a shrine to Spider-Man. Miguel is speechless and she continues, you wouldn't dare make fun of a real man. Someone who sees the big picture and is trying to redraw it. Someone who cares. Miguel has a choice at this point, the choice every spider person has. He could stay silent here or he could reveal his identity to his loved one. And in this situation, it could maybe finally win him approval from his mother, which he's never been able to have in his life ever, even going back to his childhood. So he makes his decision. He does choose that latter option, except not to win approval. Miguel listens to his mom building Spider-Man up as this person who cares, this great visionary, and he says, and what if he's not like that, huh? Ever think of that? Maybe he's just, just someone who got caught up in things. Someone who, if he never put on the costume again, he'd be perfectly happy to go back to his life. What if, and his mom cuts in, don't start, don't start tearing him down too. He's everything you aren't. Oh yeah? Oh yeah, crazy lady? Yeah. Well, try this on, crazy lady. I'm Spider-Man. Me, your son. Miguel reveals his identity to break this idealized fantasy of his mother's, show her the harsh reality, force her to confront it. Spider-Man isn't this angel, he's just another cold, lost, pathetic, uncaring failure, just like your son. And you should hate him as much as you hate me because I am him, he is me. His mother hears his words and she freezes, and she looks at him and bursts out laughing. Stop that, Miguel says. I'm I'm Spider-Man, look, I've got the talons and everything. Sure, honey, talons. She is crying, laughing, she is wheezing. Oh god, Miguel, I wouldn't have believed it. You actually got jealous of Spider-Man and tried to convince me you're him? You're still a lousy son, but you're trying harder. Thank you for caring what I think, sweetheart. And she turns around and leaves him standing alone in the room, lost and confused. Miguel is like the final boss of Spider-Verse analysis. I made all these videos and I feel like I'm starting to understand this movie a lot better, but I'm at that point where I just have all these leftover questions that I can't figure out and they just won't go away. Like what's with the I can do both two cakes motif that comes up a bunch of times? What's let him spread his wings, which comes up twice? Miles arc with his parents in general, I feel like I don't quite understand understand. Lots of big meaningful moments that I feel are deeper than they let on. Even 42 Miles, I have a sense of where that's going, maybe, possibly, but is it something that should just be understood as setting up the next movie, or is it thematically related to this movie? Was Escaping the Spider Society the end of Miles movie 2 arc, or is this somehow the end of his arc? Okay, but half of these leftover questions have to do with Miguel specifically. Why is Peter B in his backstory? That's been driving me <laughs> insane. This is Miguel's scene, it's his origin story, and there's Peter just chilling randomly? Is there a plot reason for this? Is it something movie 3 will explain? Or is there a character reason behind this? Is there a thematic thing here? Is it something more having to do with Miguel? Or is it something more about Peter B? They definitely want you to take note of this. Isn't that right, Peter? I just have no idea what I'm supposed to get from it. I don't get the vampire thing either. I don't get the claws. I don't get Lila. I don't get why he's the only spider person who's not funny. I feel like I'm missing something about the good guy, bad guy motif that we hear repeated in these scenes. And then obviously there's the big stuff, canon events, his whole ideology, his condemnation of Miles. It is so hard to make any progress whatsoever on that because there are enough good questions on his understanding of how all of this works that it seems like he's just wrong about a lot of it. But ultimately we just don't know. We don't know if he's wrong or if he is what he's wrong about. And we don't know any of the right answer speculation is completely pointless because Spider-Verse 3 is going to come in and just surprise us all whenever that comes out. So should we even try to answer any of this now? Okay, but the question that's bothered me the most about Miguel didn't actually come from a scene in the movie itself. It came from a scene not in the movie. It's something from the deleted scene that was thrown in as a bonus when he bought the digital version on Amazon. For those who missed it, I'll link the scene in the cards and in the description. The scene is a scrap version of Miles meeting Miguel. Back in this draft of the script, Miles followed Gwen to HQ in invisible mode, and we see Miguel trying to figure out who's available to send after Spot, and Miles reveals himself dramatically, but then it doesn't go how he planned. Miguel is not pleased. And then the final nail in the coffin, the straw that breaks the camel's back, is this exchange. Why do you want to be a part of this so badly? Uh, justice. Wrong answer. 
My question is, what was the right answer? What did Miguel want to hear from Miles in this moment? Seems like this scene was setting up a future exchange between these characters where the correct answer would be revealed. Miguel would say, this is why we do this, or something like that. But unfortunately, this is the only scene we get from that previous draft, so we'll never know the right answer for sure. Or at least that's what I thought. I want to rewatch Across the Spider-Verse one final time in theaters with the desperate hope in my heart that rewatching the entire movie from start to finish would trigger something for me. <laughs> I would notice some crucial detail that unlocked Miguel completely and transformed the whole way I understood the franchise. The people had been asking for a Miguel video and I was coming up empty every time I tried to understand this guy. So it was a total long shot. I didn't have expectations. And then 20 minutes in, I did end up noticing something I had totally missed that transformed everything because that is how deep this movie is. Turns out this first scene with Miguel, I'd gotten totally wrong in my head. We've got Gwen fighting Vulture. Miguel jumps in, meets Gwen. They both do some fighting. Jess joins in. She's impressed by Gwen. What about her? Miguel says no, but then Gwen shows just how skilled she is in the Spidey arts, and Miguel is impressed by that. That's what I was gonna do. And then after Gwen's father betrays her, Miguel takes that opportunity to welcome this new highly skilled spider woman onto the team. That is not what happens. I was remembering wrong. What actually happens is Miguel expresses how impressed he is, we get the awful scene with Gwen and her dad, and Miguel is still planning on not letting her join. Even when Jess says we can't just leave her here, she's doing this on her own, Miguel still does not change his mind at that point, he's still ready to leave her. And then Gwen says a line I had totally forgotten, and this is what ended up unlocking everything for me, she says this. I don't know. And only at that point does Miguel change his mind. And he doesn't just welcome her onto the team, he also says this. Yeah. Well, join the club. The implication is that what she just said is in some sense what defines the team, somehow, we don't know. So what struck me about hearing this after seeing that deleted scene is that this is the right answer to Miguel's question. It's the same scene basically, but with Gwen. We start out with Miguel against letting her join the team, and then she apparently says the right answer, she says the one thing Miguel wants to hear, the one thing that does change his mind, and after hearing that, he welcomes her onto the team. The implication being that maybe if Miles had said something like, I want to fix all the damage I've caused, that kind of answer, Miguel might have responded more favorably. And sure, that much is speculation, but this scene with Gwen is definite. So what is going on here? Why does this change his mind? What is this answer? What is Miguel hearing in the words, I don't know how to fix this? So I think the second half of this is everything. You could focus on the first half, you could say Miguel is hearing her say, I'm lost basically, I don't know what to do, but fix this is such specific wording. And it does fit so well with just the plain understanding of what Miguel is about and how he operates. Miguel is not a character who's working towards a net positive goal. Everything he's doing is to get back to status quo. On a practical level, the spider society is all about removing things that don't belong, making them go home back to where they do belong. It's repairing, containing, preventing damage to the canon, to how things should be, a standard that's been set by how things have always been. And then on a personal level, this is also what he's all about. Miguel messed up, he tried to live according to his wishes, the life he wished he had as he described it, and that failed so catastrophically that it left him with this moral debt he has to repay. We're seeing a man who will not be able to live with himself if he doesn't dedicate his entire life to fixing the mistakes of his past. The the only way he can make up for the destruction of an entire universe is if he prevents it from ever happening again. And that may sound familiar. Remember this Gwen line from the first movie? I couldn't save my best friend, so now I save everyone else. She did not say I have to save everyone else because it's the right thing to do, because justice. No, saving people is her repaying the moral debt she incurred by failing to save Peter. When Gwen's dad is after Spider-Woman, it's framed in this exact same way. Gwen. It won't bring him back. All Gwen can think about is fixing this thing that should not have happened. Fixing the past, bringing things back to how they used to be. And then Miles is also immediately thrust into this failure debt fixing thing as well. The whole first movie, again, is not about a positive goal. It is absolutely about undoing a negative. It's about fixing a situation that went wrong and it's my fault. We gotta send everyone back home, back to where they belong. We gotta do what our failure prevented Rip Peter from accomplishing. We gotta fix, literally in this case, the goober. And we gotta fill the hole that was left in this world after I caused the real Spider-Man to die. So again, it's fixing my moral failures, it's repairing the past, it's bringing everything that went wrong back up to status quo. And on that note, Kingpin was also into this fixing thing. He also doesn't have a positive villain's goal. He's just trying to bring things back to how they were, how they should have been if he hadn't messed up. And really, this is how spider 
Spider-Man works as a whole, even outside this franchise. When Spider-Man get their powers, before they can even form the thought in their heads that heaven forbid being a superhero is this exciting, amazing thing that's going to empower them to do all these exciting, amazing things, they take on the extreme moral debt of causing Uncle Ben's death and are told in no uncertain terms power is not about doing great things. Nope, with great power comes great responsibility, or as Miles' dad puts it, you know, with great ability comes great accountability. Accountability. It's all about repaying what you owe, not just what you owe from getting your powers. That's how we hear it. But every Spider-Man hears it as repaying that moral debt, fixing this ultimate failure. This is the message that every spider person hears in that fateful moment that begins their Spidey journey. Every spider person except Miles. What does Miles hear instead of with great power comes great responsibility? He hears this. You're on your way. Just, just keep going. Just keep going. Keep going, in other words, keep moving forward. This was another big leftover question I had. Writers played this line from the first movie three times in Across the Spider-Verse. They want us to have it in mind for this movie. What is that about? I think it's because more than anything else, this is what actually proves Miguel right. Miles is not Spider-Man. Obviously, yes, he gets the bite, he has the powers, he has the costume, but on a character level, he is a fundamentally different character because Spider-People are defined by their past. They're using the present to fix past mistakes, they do what they do out of a sense of responsibility created by their past failures. Miles is defined by his future. Miles is about moving forward, not being satisfied with where he's at, becoming stronger, becoming better, opening more doors to even more exciting possibilities. The ideal he's trying to conform to is not something in his past, it's his role models. Rip Peter, Peter, Gwen, all of his friends. People he sees as future versions of himself, an ideal he has to grow into. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits. Eventually. Unlike other spider characters, traditionally for Miles, the past is what he's trying to escape, and the star you see is making peace with the past and being able to move beyond it as a good thing. That is his path of development. Growing up, getting the world to stop treating him like the child he was. I am basically an oh. adult. Not being controlled by what's happened in the past in every other universe. It's the first time for everything, right? Miles does not like the idea of the past having any bearing whatsoever on his future. Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah. I'm gonna do my own thing. From the beginning, he's been uncomfortable with the whole idea of a story of canon of the past. Having a story at all seems gross. Your name? And there's a secondary theme that ties into this, also one of my leftover questions. The head versus gut motif, these lines. But my gut says that you use your head. The kid wasn't thinking. That's, That's not how he works. Stop pretending you know where you're going. I don't think he planned this out. He doesn't know any better. But you did, Gwen. Are you thinking or are you following your gut? This movie values the latter. And if you think about thinking, what does thinking consist of? It's using what you know about the world to understand the world. What you know being specifically what you learned in the past, your past experiences. You are necessarily using old data, whether it's years old or milliseconds old, it is old data to interpret the past, present, or to determine your future. All thought out plans reference the old model. But think about your gut, your repetitive drives, your wants, your desires. Your gut is a forward facing faculty. It's not making reference to the past at all. It may trigger your brain to think about the past, to think about what would satisfy your desire based on what satisfied it in the past. But the drive itself, the desire itself, the gut that is doing the desiring, there's nothing there to conceptualize the past. Your gut is only about the future. I want this, make this happen soon. That I think is the real difference between the two approaches. Is my starting point the problem or is my starting point what I want? Do I start with an intellectual problem and use thinking based on past models to dictate the solution and the plan and my future? Or do I start with what I want? Do I start with the future and work backwards to see what kind of arrangement of circumstances could make that possible? And this is the two cakes idea as well. If you're starting with a problem and thinking it out, I know I can think, I can conceptualize based on my past experiences of both eating and having and deduce that both actions require the entity to be fully intact. But if we're starting with what I want, let's say Miles wanting to write the super long message on his cake, the arrangement of circumstances where that works is having two cakes. And my thinking brain couldn't get there because to put it simplistically, that's not in my past experiences. I never had two cakes. When Pav is saying I can do both, when Gwen and Miles are trying to do both, they're not deciding to do that based on what worked in the past. They're deciding that they can do both because they want to do both. What they want is the starting point. The future is their starting point. This move forward attitude results in a huge difference in how Miles reacts to the story of Spider-Verse compared with literally every other character in the story except one who we'll talk about. Where other characters see broken things, things to fix, problems, Miles only sees opportunity. Miles is only thinking about what he wants and how to arrange 
change things to make that happen. Where other characters see a mess, what does Miles see? More like a success in progress. Gwen's primary family conflict came from this problem of not being able to tell anyone her identity, and how does Miles see it? Maybe some things are supposed to be just for us. Gwen sees a romance the universe has deemed impossible based on how things have gone in the past, and once again, how does Miles see it? It's the first time for everything, right? There's that famous quotation from Henry Ford, if I had asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Faster horses is using the past to solve a problem, but if you start with, what do I want? I want to go faster. Now let's see how we can make that happen. That is the Miles approach. And it's an incredibly optimistic approach. If you're starting with what you want, that's really starting with the assumption that what you want is possible, which means the premise is exactly as Gwen says, One thing I learned from Miles, it's all possible is a pretty ambitious premise, but all it takes is a leap of faith. Making a decision based on where you're trying to get to, not based on what the past says is possible. That is the optimistic mindset that allows you to take every attempt at life to bring you down, and with just a little shift in perspective, to see only opportunity instead. And this attitude spreads to other characters. Gwen, most of all, little by little, being around Miles transforms her whole orientation towards spidiness, until by then she is completely on team move forward. That final scene with her is what this whole friendship has been building towards. My favorite little step of this, not even in this movie, but in the first movie, is Gwen's hair. What starts as a problem and becomes an even worse problem, Miles tries to see as a solution. I like your haircut. You don't get to like my haircut. And eventually, despite Gwen having trouble finding a hairstyle that suits her, the problem hairstyle becomes Gwen's favorite, and that's the one she sticks with. Miles' parents also start to change. They both start out only thinking about preserving the status quo, fixing their problems with Miles by preventing things from changing at all, like these examples. Princeton University. In New Jersey? No, 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 that's too far. There's great schools in Brooklyn. Don't take them from me. <laughs> wow. You're grounded. Let me fix you. Okay, that last one was a gimme, or was it? It's interesting because it happens to use the same word, but it comes right before Rio's whole speech about sending Miles off into the world and ungrounding him, which is all extremely forward thinking. And what we really end up with is a hybrid. She wants him to go off to his exciting future, but to not forget where he came from. She wants him to grow up into a man while still being her little boy. And if you really think about it, the fixing she's doing here isn't Google's definition number three of fixing, mend or repair. In this moment where Rio says this, she's trying to make him look nice for Gwanda, which is more like Google's definition 3A of fixing. Do the necessary work to improve or adapt something. As in, let me fix up the guest room for you. And that is a very forward-thinking way of fixing something, you're making it better, and it's not improving a deficient state as determined by a past standard, but by a future need. Jeff is also a hybrid. Despite being all about getting his son to live up to the standards of his school and the law and all these ideals set by the past, Miles from the start was inspired by something totally different from his dad's life. Dad, when you were my age, you followed your dream and went out on your own to start a business with Uncle Aaron, right? And in that moment, Jeff gets a bit flustered, trying to hold himself accountable to his past, and he says, Look, life is a journey. Very forward-thinking perspective, so he has a hint of this already, and then by the end, we get this. We got a whole new kid who just wants to grow up so fast, and maybe we gotta grow up too. Maybe we just gotta let him spread his wings. And what we're starting to piece together here is a spectrum of character philosophies or outlooks or modus operandi, whatever you want to call it. And I love when it's not just, oh, this character is Outlook X, and this character is Outlook Y. And it's just two philosophies that are totally different, zero overlap. A continuum is so much more interesting to me. So here we've got on one side, the fix-it mentality. The past ideal, restore status quo, use your head. And then on the other side, we have the move forward mentality. The future ideal, growth mentality, use your gut. I mean, go ahead and place all the characters along this one continuum. Miguel actually started off here on the forward-thinking gut end of things. As he said, he was living life with the starting point of what he wanted, the life he wished he had, and that failed him and moved him all the way to the other end of the spectrum. And then we have Miles, who does end up all the way on the other end, but he has to work for it. At the beginning of the movie, Gwen, in Miles' eyes, is the future. But as he gradually comes to realize that Gwen is just another force in his life, trying to make him conform to some story he doesn't see as his own, at that point, Miles has to cut himself free of that past ideal as well. Bye. So anyway, we get Miles starting somewhere here and then moving his way up. Gwen starts out all about the past, fixing her past failures and longing for her time with Miles. And it goes way back before that as well. This is how she was raised. 
I always taught you to do it by the book. The book, i.e. accountability to a standard set by past circumstances. But then as her dad slides over to the middle of our spectrum, casting aside his past and its past ideals, Gwen moves all the way up as well to stand right beside Miles, starting her own band, not just joining one that pre-existed her, but starting from where she wants and knowing that anything is possible. Miles' parents, as we said, start on the fix-it end, but not quite as far as Miguel, and they both move as well, ending up somewhere in the middle, willing to let Miles spread his wings, but not completely. Tell him five months. Okay, now what about a character like Hobie? So you think that Hobie would be right there with Miles and Gwen, since he is a character who acts as a guide for both of them in the story, but it's interesting. It's an awkwardly inconvenient point for Hobie fans, me included, but this character is not about moving forward. He is not about making anything new. He is only about tearing down the old. He is only about hating this, hating that. He is about rejecting ideas he doesn't like, fighting against systems he doesn't like, all of which are relics of the past that he does want to move on from, except he doesn't have any positive ideas ideology of his own. Nothing new is advancing on that front at all for him. And when it does come to doing something proactive, despite how effective he is, all he can think to do is steal inventions other people made and support other people who do have the initiative to move forward. Again, nothing new from him. Hobie is not the one who breaks canon himself. He's not the one who starts a new elite spider force. Hobie is a character who has cast the past aside, but he's still oriented in that direction. Although you gotta say, by the end of the movie, it seems like he is ready for a character like Gwen to be the guide for him and to lead him into the future. So maybe he will keep moving this way in movie. 3. Peter B. is another really interesting case. He came out of Spider-Verse 1 completely in Miles' camp. He was all about moving forward, and after all, he was the one who taught Miles about the leap of faith, and obviously being around Miles is what causes him to join MJ and being forward-thinking. She wanted kids, and now he does too. But before he could go full Miles, he apparently ended up witnessing Miguel's catastrophic backstory, and that just yoinked him back to the middle. And he had to reckon with the fact that bad stuff does happen sometimes, moral debt is incurred, and you do need to devote everything you can to fixing things sometimes, and the result was an exact mix of the two perspectives. If not for Uncle Ben, most of us wouldn't be here, Miles. All the good we did, it wouldn't have been done. There's forward motion and there's backward motion also. There's a time for both. Bad things are gonna happen, but good things happen too, you know? And it's just so fitting, Peter B is the only Jewish Spider-Man we meet, and this mentality is just so Jewish. Peter B's philosophy is King Solomon's famous times in Ecclesiastes, and even in this Jewish custom we see him keeping in his intro, the mid-hug being that when we're enjoying things that make us the happiest, weddings, having a house, dressing up, etc. We do something to remember the worst things that have happened to us as well. And like everyone else, with Miles winning in this movie against Miguel, it seems Beater is yet another character who's ready to move more towards the future side of things. Okay, but now, the most fascinating character to place on the spectrum is the only character who arguably beats Miles to the future end of the spectrum in literally every aspect. Who is the most forward-thinking character in the movie? The most optimistic, the most future-guided, the most anti-fix-it? Who has already long adopted this mentality fully by the time Miles gets there in the end? Of course, I'm talking about about spot. My holes aren't a curse, they're the answer. I'm on a journey of self improvement. All right, this is gonna work. What was that? Our future. The Spot is by far the most broken character, just so actually literally broken on an existential level, and weirdly enough, he is not trying to fix himself. He is not trying to undo this broken state at all, not trying to return to the past, not trying to restore the status quo. What is he trying to do? I'm about to be so much more than a villain of the week. Now, he didn't start this way. He was sort of doing the fix-it thing when we first met him. We hear him mentioning that before the ATM machine scene, he was trying to find a job. That does sound like he was very clumsily trying to restore his old life, but very quickly, still in Act 1, he comes to an understanding of what he could be, and he devotes everything to chasing that. This is gonna be good for us, Spider-Man. You and me, we're finally gonna live up to our potential. And he does become this by the middle of the movie. He beats our protagonist to the developmental finish line, so to speak. Okay, now I'll admit here, I don't quite understand where Miles is in the end of the movie where he gives this speech. It seems like he has cast aside this past ideal that's been holding him back for so long, but it also seems roughly like he's come to some understanding of his future being an outgrowth of his past. But what's truly fascinating is that it almost doesn't matter where Miles is here in this Act 3 scene, because all that changes here in this Act 3 scene. I've seen this thing before before with the spectrum where he put all the characters on it, and that tells you something about how the story will treat them. Arcane does this, so does Princess Mononoke, so does Cloud Atlas. But what we usually see is that the sweet victory waiting at the end of the story is apportioned to our cast of characters based on how close they've made it to the good end of the spectrum. If they learn the lesson of the movie or embody the ideals espoused by the movie, they are rewarded with a good outcome. And if they didn't learn, or they didn't make it far enough, or they were bad by the standards of the movie, the narrative punishes them with failure. But with Across the Spider-Verse, we're dealing with an entirely different paradigm, because this movie is part 
part two of a trilogy. And as is very common with part twos, there is no sweet victory waiting at the end of this road. In part twos, even in some act twos, you will often see everyone fail. The villain fails to get what they want, and the hero also fails to get what they want. And both of them need to develop further, until we often see some kind of joint endpoint that encompasses both of their arcs. And that failure is what happens here too. Miguel does not get what he wants, and Miles also does not get what he wants. And the development they're both lacking, interestingly enough, the way the story sees this, mirrors exactly what Miguel's mother told him in the scene from the comics I started the video with. As awful of a person as she is, her criticisms of Miguel were valid. He doesn't care, and all he does is tear everything down. Put in terms of the ideas we've been talking about, if you really are all about the fixed life, if you're really trying to restore the past, then your only recourse will be destruction. Because you cannot truly bring back what's lost, you can only erase what's new. And that's what will cause you to fail. Miguel solves every problem by undoing, by destroying, by tearing down. If anomalies are the problem, send them back home. If Miles is the problem, shut him down. If Gwen is the problem, get rid of her. And if it feels like everything around you is the problem, then destroy everything around you. As is, he can only exist by destroying what is otherwise trying to move forward, and in that sense he is a vampire. Sucking life, i.e. growth, newness, change from everything around him, and he is a predator. Instead of human hands which can manipulate the environment and do things, build things, he has claws which cannot do any of that. They can only tear down what's already there. And you see an aspect of this even in his humor, and he is funny by the way, but it's sarcasm, it's insult humor. <laughs> I'm really excited to get oh, going. And great. What few funny moments he has are essentially tearing others down, making you feel dumb. Spider-Verse. Oh, that's stupid. So the story makes Miguel fail because you cannot be a hero if all you can do is destroy. To adapt one of the greatest lines ever in superhero fiction, you either die the good guy or you live long enough to see yourself become the bad guy. That is what the story is telling Miguel over and over through his mom in the comics and through the good guy bad guy motif that's all over the movie. We are supposed to be the good guys. And then we also have Miguel's mom's second issue. He doesn't care. If you're living so much in the past, you will find it hard to care about to value the present. Simple as that. If the past is setting a standard for a world that is changing and cannot meet those ideals, then everything is falling short of what it should be. It's all broken. None of it is good enough. None of it really matters. And that is also how he failed. If he had shown more care, if he had not forced the suffering on so many of his Spire Society members, they wouldn't have turned against him. And both of these points are mirrored in Miles in the inverse. Miles is someone who can only build, and he also doesn't care. Because if you're living so much in the future, you will also find it hard to value the present. If the future is setting the standard for a world that is not there yet, and has not yet met those ideals, then once again, everything's gonna fall short of what it should be. Everything will be not quite good enough, none of it will matter. Miles does not value his family, he does not value where he's from, he is laser focused on moving on, growing up, escaping his childhood, escaping his hometown, escaping his universe. And by the time he does value his present, it's too late. And here he runs into the other problem. If you're only interested in building new things that are different from what exists, you will find yourself in a scary, unfamiliar new world. Miguel could totally have warned him about this one. It is easy to see the endless possibilities of the future and only fixate on what you wish to happen on the good possibilities and just not think about the bad possibilities that are out there too. But if anything is possible, then that means your worst nightmares are also possible. Anything being possible should terrify you as much as it gives you hope. Miles' optimism is misplaced, it is naive. You cannot be this future focused and just assume a good future is going to come down from the heavens tied up in a nice bow. If you take a leap of faith every single time, then just statistically you're going to eventually fall to your doom in some way, shape, or form. So if Miguel and Miles are both wrong, what is the right mindset? What's the right way to see past, present, and future? What is the answer to these questions that all the characters are grappling with? to be continued. Starry hasn't told us yet, we'll see where this journey is taking us in part 3. So Miguel is right about Miles. Miles Morales is not Spider-Man. He's grown up with two loving parents. The words he lives by are not, with great power comes great responsibility, but this... Just keep going. And because of those future-oriented words, he is not haunted by the death of his uncle in the same way your average Peter Parker is. He misses him, but he processes it, and he does keep moving forward. We do not see the guilt that consumes so many spider people who lose their loved ones. That is absent from the character completely. And Miles also does not make the decision so many spider people make to separate from the people he loves. He goes back to them, or he tries to at least. And Miles himself even separates from the very identity of Spider-Man in his escape from the Spider Society. In the end, when he restates his Spider-Man intro, he skips the I'm Spider-Man part. My name is Miles Morales. 
I was bitten by a radioactive spider. This is a new story. It is not the Peter Parker Spider-Man story. We have other characters who do follow that story. But Miles' story is different. His whole character journey is different. That's a fact. But that is also the beautiful thing about Spider-Man and it's the beautiful thing about this movie. I think what everyone expected from a Spider-Verse movie was the idea that we can take any type of person, even if they don't look like Peter Parker, even if they're totally different from a different world, and give that person the story of Spider-Man because it can be anyone behind the mask. But no, what we got instead was the idea that we can take any story, even if it's not the story of Peter Parker, and make that the story of Spider-Man because it can be truly anyone behind the mask, even someone with a different story. That is a much, much deeper level of that idea. Truly brilliant. Subscribe. I was trying to think of writer takeaways from Miguel, and it was actually quite difficult. I think it's just because this level of antagonist character work is so advanced. The continuum thing, there's definitely a lot to learn from that. This movie is so good at having every character dealing with the same issue in different ways. Also got this phenomenon of the strengths of the antagonist being explored through the flaws of the heroes. Definitely a lot there. You also have the hero succeeding and failing, being right and wrong. You also have the beautiful job they did of taking a hero story and adapting it to an antagonist, showing the wrong lessons to learn from it, the wrong actions to take, but still keeping it ambiguous, keeping it convincing to the point that other characters aren't sure who to side with and even the audience isn't sure who to side with. So subtly done, so much to study, so much to learn from. I'm gonna keep thinking about it, but feel free to comment your own takeaways from the character. I would love to hear them. Also, by the way, Lila, the one major leftover question of mine this video left unanswered, the final, final boss of Spider-Verse analysis, what is the deal with her? And I mean beyond just a fun foil for a serious character, I am totally stumped. Any and all theories are welcome. I think I have one more Spider-Verse video coming for sure, possibly two, but almost definitely one. And let's just say it's a video that both Arcane fans and Spider-Verse fans should look forward to, if that gives you any hints. But right now, I am burnt out, so I'm going to take a little bit of a break. So expect it at some point soon, not immediately. I'm going to be doing a Spider-Verse 1 watch party on my Patreon Discord this week at some point, so feel free to join us if that sounds fun to you. And also, just if you're looking for a fun and welcoming community of creative people, we would love to have you. So I will leave my Patreon link in the description and in the cards, as always. Shoutouts to the new high-tier patrons, Tim Davies, Stephen Dewhurst, huge thanks to you. Big thanks to all the patrons, as always, the support means the world to me. Hope everyone enjoyed, and thanks for watching. Oh, one more thing. If Sony copy claimed me again for background music in the clips of character quotes, which is so stupid, hopefully you saw the video before that happened so you could have a smooth viewing experience. And if you didn't, my apologies. Ah, Sony.